28 was meant to finish at 7 a.m. this morning GMT. Um, we should have known better uh, than to think that five hours later we'd be able to reflect on a final outcome. Um, and I expect that the wonderful lineup of contributors we have for our panel is pretty much on tenterhooks awaiting news. Um, my understanding is that there may be a new draft agreement at around two o'clock. Um, so we do understand if you're going to be looking on your various feeds for latest developments, my only request is that you alert us to any that you hear about during the course of this meeting. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'm going to come to you for short initial comments. Um, bear with me if I interrupt you as I move things along and try to get round you. And then we'll hopefully open up for a sort of more um, discursive conversation um, uh, later on. So uh, several of you are still in Dubai. Some of you have all already come home. And I'm just wondering um, what the atmosphere is at the moment. And I'm going to start with Carlos Zapeda. Carlos is from the Laudate Si Research Institute. Um, what does it feel like to be in uh, Dubai right now? I think it's um, the best way I can describe it is like arriving into a big city um, like London and it's full of people all walking around with ideas, with uh, policies, agendas and a lot of dynamics going unfolding. And you can't help wonder how much of this 70,000 plus people are connecting in ways that are transformative or that are just uh, more of the same. And, and, and it's this balancing act, I think, which is, is, is the feeling. You see the grandeur of you know, thousands of people just walking, you know, indigenous communities, uh, walking with the faith, uh, you know, with some policymakers running around, Al Jaba going into a, in, in a buggy around looking at the, at the sites. And um, it's just a really, really weird feeling uh, that uh, we are a sample of humanity placed in a in a, in like a what seems like a giant fair uh and then we're supposed to fix the problem of climate change by um interacting but at the same time we are in silos and in tribes it's it's a, it's a weird feeling of this um in which you you do really you do really want to change things but um there's only a fraction of what you can do in in a space like that even if you try your best, your very best to connect with as many people as you can and many organisations. Right. Well, Chief Doluwaru Zakaria, you're from Ghana and you've been, do unmute yourself, please. Um, so you have been moving, I understand, between um, the UN sort of sponsored faith pavilion, where sort of faith activists and campaigners were meeting and talking and observing the conversations within the COP itself. I mean, have you seen any traffic between the two or have they been fairly sort of well siloed? Thank you. I think that um, here has been more inclusive um i think the organizers need to be commended for bringing everybody on board i think they want to achieve a decision that will be best for all of us uh, as a civil society organization uh, my responsibility here basically was to contribute on how to raise funds for more climate work and also contribute towards urban wisdom in terms of how to bring indigenous on board when it comes to urban planning. Before um, urban planning, indigenous have lived happily without these challenges of climate. So I think that they have been left out and it is important that we bring them on board when it comes to planning and comes to how to manage our environment well. But generally, from my perspective, I think that it has been more inclusive and everybody is on board. I think the, the question is, I suppose, what's going on within the COP right now? I mean, there are some things that have been agreed at the COP earlier on about a loss and damage fund. There have been a welcome for that, although questions remain about it. But I mean, the big question, I suppose, is what might come out of it in terms of the wording about phasing out or not, or just reducing um, fossil fuels. And that's the that seems to be the question on which the the outcome, success or breakdown of these talks 
seem to um, to stand. I mean, do you think what what do you think might come out of this? Do you think there will be any um, recognition of the need to phase phase out fossil fuels in this next communique, or does that seem like a um, whistling in the wind? I'm very hopeful that there will be a decision of phase down. I think that um, everybody is trying to make a point. Um, they may be entrained position, but um, my observation is that people are trying to make sure that they strongly make a point for uh, an inclusion. That's the reason why there is an initial entrained position, but I think that my role is purely a civil society one, that is to ensure that we come from the moral point of view, that we have a responsibility towards the F, we have a responsibility towards the planet, and we must look at the decisions that we are going to take today, its implication or any impact into the future. And I think that everybody will, there will be a deal, a positive deal of phase down. That is my point. Alan Otaro, um, you are the founder executive of the Catholic Youth Network for Environmental Sustainability in Africa. I mean, do you do you share that optimism? How does it feel where where you are? You're also in Dubai, but how how are you feeling about the prospects of some sort of agreement? Yeah, um, thank you, thank you, Rosie. Um, there's a sense of uh, a dramatic end um, at this COP, uh, as is the case with the most other COPs. I think this is just the uh, structure of uh, intergovernmental uh, processes um, that they tend to take to stretch out as much as possible because uh, people have hustle over words and the meaning of words and the implication of those words. Uh, and therefore, this, uh, I think, in my view, was uh, was to be expected at, at this stage. Um, although I should say that uh, the beginning of this COP was also um, rather dramatic in a positive way, because I think it was the first COP where I saw um, some sort of agreement being reached uh, in the first few um, hours with the loss and damage um, issue. Um, but now, uh, as you said, I mean, we are all watching to see uh, what happens um, on those other texts that are yet to be agreed upon. I think for me, the, the challenge, um, juxtaposing what's going on here with uh, what's going on across the world in terms of climate impacts, which uh, are still continuing. I mean, um, just uh, during this COP, there was a serious uh, mudslide uh, in the northern part of Tanzania, uh, where tens of people uh, died and livelihoods and homes were destroyed. Um, just yesterday, um, I'm getting news from my colleagues in Zimbabwe about a storm that has destroyed uh, some schools. Uh, in parts of Zimbabwe. So I think that disconnect between uh, what's going on here in the negotiation rooms, uh, keeping in touch or keeping uh, having your finger on the pulse of what's actually happening back in the communities and being aware and conscious of the responsibility as the negotiators about um, the, their need to come up with concrete ambitious uh, resolutions in the text that they're negotiating um, is, is really crucial. Thank you. Um, I wonder if I could come to Farah Gulawali Katara. You're the Global Programme Coordinator for Faith for Our Planet, based in Pakistan. Um, I'm just wondering, you're, you're in Dubai, but I'm just wondering what the messages are that you are getting um, from home. Um, um, I mean, there's a lot of sort of um, very unhappy, very angry voices um, that we're hearing, particularly from young people who are saying, you know, that the negotiators aren't delivering what they need to deliver, that in fact, it's, you know, it's worse than that, really. Um, and I, I just wonder what you're what you're hearing. So I think to start with, I would echo Alan's sentiment that we started off quite hopeful because, as you know, Pakistan was one of the sort of major leads for the charge for loss and damage at the previous COP in Sharma Sheikh. Um, that was following the sort of apocalyptic flood that we had and was um, Pakistan was, you know, at the helm of the demand for loss and damage in that particular year, which we were very happy that actually came through. Um, and in the first few days, I think reaching a deal was was a great marker of success. And, and for a lot of people that was like, OK, at least we've hit this benchmark. But of course, there's still a lot of uncertainty. Now, when we kind of have gone through the COP motions, we still find that there is uncertainty around um, 
the sort of technicalities around loss and damage that, okay, well, is it voluntary? Is it not? Who's going to pay? How much are they going to pay? I think there's been quite a bit of criticism um, levied at, at the US and the UK for really not um, paying in proportion to their, their emissions and their role in, uh, in the climate crisis. Uh, whereas, you know, other countries like Germany or France or the UAE itself have you know, been, been a bit more committal in climate financing. Um, but now I think reaching toward the end, a dramatic end was always expected. You know, this the COP presidency had laid out this ambitious plan quite early on um, in terms of tripling renewables and phase out. And we always knew this was going to be difficult going in. Um, I think the fact that if over 100 countries have committed to tripling renewables is good, but we did know that this was going to be a very difficult thing to push through. And given the UN's rules that any agreement needs to be unanimous, so 198 countries need to agree to actually make this happen, means that it's naturally going to be quite difficult. Can I, can I ask you very briefly, I mean, tripling renewables, the loss and damage, positive things. Mm -hmm. um, but the, if, if there's not very strong wording on the phase out of fossil fuels, has anything been achieved given that, you know, 90% of carbon emissions are down to fossil fuels? I mean, can it, can it in any way, can heart be taken from the COP if it doesn't come up with some sort of strong statement about the um, elimination of fossil fuels? I think speaking from where, where I did come from, from Pakistan and from, you know, the global south, it's definitely going to hurt morale um, if, if we're not able to sincerely and and strongly commit to the program. Um, we do know that this is, we there has to be basic recognition of this from every government. Um, and for the Global South, because of the disproportionate vulnerability that we experience and the floods are sort of living proof of that. But then as Alan mentioned, multiple other countries during the course of COP have experienced similar disasters. Um, for them, there's definitely going to be, the, the morale is going to take a hit. And I, I think to speak to your question earlier, that it's more than ever, I think it's young people who are, who need to be seated at the table, who are increasingly frustrated because this is their world to inherit. This is something that they will need to, this is a battle they will have to take on long after COP28 is over. And so there's, there's definitely, um, I, I do think that I try to be hopeful, as like Chief Daliwara has said, we want to try and remain hopeful. Um, we did expect this to be yeah. quite a dramatic end, um, but we could, can have to acknowledge that, yes, for Global South countries, this is going to be a bit of a, you know, demoralizing Thank moment. You. Thank you. Um Rabbi Jonathan Nerrill, you're the executive director for the Interface Centre for Sustainable Development based in the US, I think. Um, I'd, but I'd, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about what faith organisations have brought to um, this event. I see that you're at the Faith Pavilion. Um, I, I, and uh, I, just, I just wonder, as you're gathered watching, watching the sort of last minute wrangling fearing for what may or may not come out of this. I wonder what you feel the contribution of the Faith Pavilion has been. Well, I think that this year, more than any other year in the climate cops, faith communities are, are showing up with a stronger voice. And that began on uh, at the inauguration of the Faith Pavilion when Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar De delivered video messages. They were originally going to come in person. Uh, and, and that continued with uh, Sadhguru and uh, Guru Dev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar delivering in-person messages uh, together with 75 other religious figures and clergy. Uh, in total, we had 70 sessions and 325 speakers. I think it was the largest interfaith climate event in history. Yeah. So you know, part of it is is actually an attempt to shift the narrative that it's not all about fossil fuels and decarbonization and, you know, specific agendas within the, the agreements, but there's actually something deeper that's happening on planet Earth, which is why is the climate crisis occurring? That the climate crisis has deeper roots, which include materialism, greed, short-term thinking, 
and seeking our pleasure fulfillment in the physical. Forgive me for interrupting, those could be the very things that are holding back an agreement on phasing out fossil fuels, couldn't it? When you say there's something deeper going on. Yeah, I mean, you know, we need to think, why is it that that uh, 28 cops that, that we're seeing similar outcomes, that, that the nations negotiate, yet every year the problem gets worse? And I think part of it has to do with this with with this idea that that the COP, which is the conference of the parties, uh, and which and a party meaning a nation state, that that these nation states who are all trying to protect their national interests and negotiate to maximize their national interests, that they're going to somehow come to an agreement that will curb climate change, and 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 so the the faith pavilion has essentially we've brought together people from all around the world from many faiths including indigenous traditions and and we're saying look we're all in this together it's not about trying to maximize our narrow national interests it's about how do we as a as a collective as humanity on one ship how do we come together to solve this crisis through uh, an awareness of interdependence interconnection love for god's creation Humility, simplicity, modesty—these are all spiritual values that we Does need that to raise up. Get through to it, to anything or anyone that are fighting for their national interests in the negotiating rooms. That's you know that's that's the question, I suppose, isn't it? Well, I think you know th- this. The New York Times covered the Faith Pavilion. Two thousand media outlets mm. uh, reported about it. So I think the message is getting through, and we actually had several government ministers come here and speak at the pavilion. We had country delegates meet with religious figures. You know, look, we're not this. We could be doing a better job, but but I think that the the religious community in general upped its game in terms of of, of trying to have an impact at a broader level. It certainly does seem to be that way. I mean, I've been on a couple of the the live stream zooms, and I think they've been they've been terrific. Um, I mean, I hope that some of this sort of um, the lobbyists, the business lobbyists and the oil lobbyists also um, took time to to sort of step into the pavilion. But, but I mean, um, I suppose the question that you're raising is, yes, what do we do? We can't leave it up to the national governments to do it all because they struggle so hard. I mean, Lorna Gold, I mean, you're um, CEO of Faith Invest, which sort of tries to encourage people to look at where their investments go. Um, I mean, what what's your view about... Um, you know, the extent to which faith organisations just need to do things anyway, because you can't wait for world leaders to to act. Yeah, Rosie, I mean, maybe before I come to that, just to maybe comment a little bit on my own experience at the COP and, and uh, some of kind of pick up on some of the things that have been said already. I mean, I, I really kind of identify with Carlos and his impression that you could kind of feel like you were wandering around in this bubble this giant bubble at COP not quite sure how it all interconnected but I think that the faith pavilion has really made a significant difference in terms of the coming together of the different faiths and that kind of collaboration that's needed across different faith areas in very practical kind of planning, organising. There was a concern with the Faith Pavilion, I'll be honest, that because it was sponsored by the UAE, that somehow it wouldn't be radical in the sense of an organising space. But I think that the faith people who came there really occupied it in the sense of used it to its max as a space to network, a space to plan, a space to coordinate. And around those things like investments, around um, projects, fundraising, all those different aspects of how you kind of move forward as a sector of civil society. My reading of COP, not knowing how the outcome's going to be today, is that the fossil fuel genie is out the bottle now um, and it won't be put back in. When I say that, we're reaping in this COP what was sown in Paris. In Paris, the Paris Agreement made no reference to fossil fuels and that left wide open the interpretation of oil states and others on how we could reach our objectives of what, remaining within 1.5. In this COP, it was Pope Francis in particular in his message on the global stock take who called for the elimination of fossil fuels. That almost went like a jolt of electricity around the COP on the first day. It then was broken wide open by Mary Robinson in The Guardian releasing that 
a really quite um, shocking exchange between Mary Robinson and the, the COP president um, prior to the COP um, around challenging his role um, as a, the head of an oil company and whether that compromised. So the oil genie was out the bottle and continued to grow this momentum around how to deal with fossil fuels throughout the last two weeks. It was very uncomfortable, especially for the presidency, because I think everything at the COP kind of spoke to everything but fossil fuels. It felt like a kind of surreal reality. I think a couple of ways that the, COP, the faiths have really stepped up here. One is in the support for the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty idea. And the faiths were very active in speaking at the the big meeting around that where Colombia um, agreed to, to pursue that. There's now 12 countries pursuing that as a mechanism for a managed phase out of fossil fuels. That will continue to grow beyond COP. There was a joint letter from the Faith Pavilion which was issued, which was really clear in its acknowledgement of the need to phase out fossil fuels and to um, align with the science, which was really significant. Over 66 faith leaders have signed on to the big letter, a leadership letter, which now has 2,000 signatories calling for an equitable phase out of fossil fuels and all everything that relates to the adherence from the science. And the Vatican State this year has played a very active role in the COP negotiations and has had members of Catholic civil society on the negotiation and that has been very important yeah. and they've been shuffling back and forward mm -hmm. uh, within from the faith pavilion into the main negotiations. I wonder I mean just still on fossil fuels for a moment um, the decision has been taken that the next COP um, is going to be in Azerbaijan which is a, an, I understand another oil producing country and I, I just wonder what the responses are to uh, that decision whether that's um, going to give any confidence to um, faith organisations and campaigners on on this issue. I mean, Chief Dolawaro Sakari, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on where, if you could choose where the COP was next year, where would you like it to be? Um, it, you can't, I'm afraid it's too late, but I mean, I'm just sort of interested in, in, in that choice um, and uh, what the response to that choice is among the people that you're speaking to. I think that the choice is not the main subject matter. What is important is the collective decision that will be taken in the interest of the people. That is my main issue here. If we look at it from um, this particular COP28, yes, as a civil society organization, if you look at some of the decisions that have been taken, like you asked one of my colleagues, a lot of steps have been taken. A lot of achievements have been made. If you look at the issue of uh, the amount of money that have been pledged to solve um, a lot of problems uh, in respect of climate change. I think that is significant. It may not be enough. For instance, the loss and damage fund of 725 million is significant. It may not be enough. If you look at the COF presidency ability to put up 30 billion, which is expected to grow to 250 billion, and by 2030, it's significant. It may not be enough, but there have also been specific issues that matters to us. For instance, the issue of um, green climate, 3.5 billion has been put there. If you look at the issue of food health, 2.7, food security, 2.6, conservation, 2.6, and also recovery of 1.2 are significant milestones that we need to comment them. However, I am very optimistic that living here, there will certainly be compromises. And I think that we should be hopeful that something will happen as faith leaders. We believe that God is always working, but I think this should be expected. And I don't think that uh, where it will take place shouldn't be the subject matter. It can take place anywhere. Uh, Jonathan Neril, um, one of the um, events that took place in the Faith Pavilion, I understand, which I didn't um, manage to get to, was about the um, religious opposition to climate activism. So it's, you know, you've got all these faith organisations saying we need to act. And then you've got, you've got these 
Um, I mean, particularly perhaps in the States, but uh, probably elsewhere as well, um, saying, um, actually, we don't need to act. Um, and uh, and I just I, I just wonder um, the extent to which you identify religion as a problem as well as a solution to the issues that we're facing. Sure. So, you know, I, I, I agree with uh, what, what uh, the chief just mentioned. And, um, you know, we had a session yesterday on uh, exploring religious resistance to climate change. Yeah. And, and we had a professor from a U.S. university who was who presented a slide that showed that over the past 10 years, the percentage of people in the United States of religious people who uh, consider climate change to be a crisis has actually declined. Uh, while the percentage of people who consider themselves atheists, uh, that they, they're more in agreement that it's a crisis. Uh, and it's declined to, to such an extent, for example, within uh, white evangelicals in the U.S. that only 8% uh, consider climate change to be a crisis, whereas 92% uh, think it's not a crisis. And, 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 and that's also true of other people in other denom Christian denominations and other religions, uh, not the same percentage, but, but a general sense, the majority not considering this to be a crisis. And, and so I think there's a lot of work to do within religious communities. Uh, you know, some people think that the climate scientists and the business people and the political leaders will solve climate change. And the religious communities can just sort of do their own thing. They can continue to focus on theology and liturgy and homiletics and hermeneutics. Uh, and the, let the tree huggers and the environmentalists do, deal with this. This isn't a, a religious issue. Um, but I, I think that until we until religion gets fully on board in curbing climate change, we're actually not going to see a solution to the problem. As I said before, because it has spiritual roots and spiritual solutions, and because 85% of people in the world affiliate with the religion. So, yeah. Yeah, but I wonder, I mean, I wonder, Farwell Gulamali Kato, I don't know if you can um, respond to this, but, you know, whether as um, you get religious voices resisting um, climate activism um, in, in Christian parts of America or so on, I mean, I wonder whether you are hearing that um, in, in, in Muslim um, countries as well, whether there's a theology there which says, well, we don't need to do anything about it. Um, you know, God will, God's in charge ultimately, and therefore, you know, we don't need to do anything. Or, I mean, I mean, do you do you see vested interests being sort of cloaked in sort of religious uh, language and thinking as a way of um, of not doing anything? I think it it really depends on the context. Again, if you sort of go to to where I'm from and you look at Pakistan. Um, that sentiment certainly exists that, okay, well, you know, Allah is going to take care of it. If there's a problem, either it's the end of the world and we just have to accept it. This is part of Allah's plan or then Allah is going to take care of this problem. And that for a lot of people isn't really cloaking any particular political or economic or corporate interest. That is genuinely what they believe simply because in, in Pakistan, um, that basic, we have any, there are so many communities that haven't even arrived at the basic understanding of like, oh yeah, this, this is a significant problem. This is happening. Um, you know, I was, I, when I would sit and, you know, travel between the, the cop venue and back and you have um, a lot of people from South Asia who are sort of in the transport uh, industry here in the UAE. And they don't even know what's going on. They're just like, you know, they're asking you, like, what's this? What's happening here? Like, what is this about? Are they doing a show? And you realize just how disconnected people might be from that in that they don't even know what's going on in the first place. So having, getting to a point, arriving at a point where you're saying that, okay, religion can be used to motivate people to address it. Well, first they have to know it exists in the first place. And that is um, in Pakistan, that's a major challenge. Uh, and so, and then you have to convince the next thing you have to do is once you educate them on the subject that, hey, this is happening and, you know, see what's happening to your weather, to your livestock, to your agricultural produce. Um, and you get them past that, the next phase is like, okay, then you can start talking about, um, you know, what do we do about it, if anything at all? And then what are the responsibilities, spiritual, moral obligations that one would have to addressing the problem? Thank you. Um, Carlos, 
Peter, uh, before we, we uh, began this Zoom, you were telling me that there was a lot of washing being done in um, Dubai, and, uh, as, as well as greenwashing. You mentioned faith washing, and I just wonder, can you explain what you're seeing, what you mean by that phrase? I think people have uh, realised that uh, faith communities can be transformative and can really make a change in environmental governance. And and as well, uh, there is one thing that uh, faith communities can bring, which is credibility, because they are hinged in values and transformative values is exactly what they need in many ways to legitimize a lot of their actions. Now, if you think about corporations and lobbyists, climate lobbyists and funders, and perhaps Lorna can, can jump in in some, some of this as well, in terms of what it, what it means in terms of investment. Um, the choices that people have is, what do we do uh, that can be uh, looked, that will look as if we're doing good and we're doing green things, and but also in conjunction with the with the faith communities. This is a, a very, uh, you know, it's a present uh, and real danger, um, especially where the, where the fact that a lot of the um, science communities are not even trickling in the policymakers, never mind uh, other, other parts of society. You know, you saw Sultan Al Jabbar saying there is no science out there that says that the face out of, of fossil fuels is what's going to achieve 1.5 degrees Celsius. If you have that at the very top, can you imagine what it means when um, you have a lot of lobbyists and a lot of investors and at the same time trying to go, for instance, going in the faith pavilion, exchanging cards, trying to, um, you know, can we collaborate? Can we do stuff together? And then you have this real risk in which that we start um, deflating the importance of the values that really and we need to make the values at the center. And this is this is really what the what the problem is at the moment. There is an emergency, and people are not embracing. Um, they, they just think that it's just about C, removing CO two tons, as if that is going to be the whole solution. And and I think um, uh, Jonathan uh, uh, was exactly on spot with with the message that we need to go to the roots of a problem, the causal roots of a problem. Net zero by itself is not going to, even if we remove all CO2 tons tomorrow, we haven't removed the production machine that allowed us to destroy this planet in the way that we've got it. So um, a lot of the uh, uh, insights that I got from this climate COP is that A, we need to go back to the values, go back to the roots. And that's what faith communities can give their own. And, and B, we need to really realize that um, we need to transform that into, into policymaking practices that we can recommend directly to the policymakers. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit here, um, but I'm delighted that a couple of other people have joined our call. Dr. Fakhruddin Mangunjaya, forgive me if I've not pronounced your name quite right. You're back in Indonesia, having been at the COP. Um, and you're um, a Muslim ecological scholar. And I wonder what you were able to say to um, decision makers in Dubai, politicians in Dubai, uh, Muslim leaders in Dubai about why they need to act now on climate change. Thank you, uh, Rossi. Um, uh, glad to, to know that this conversation happened after uh, everyone go back uh, uh, with the election uh, regarding the COP28. However, there are long um, dialogues, 28 years or more, this uh, conference of parties happen. Uh, we have uh, a negotiation, we have a scheme, we have protocol, we have everything in the courts. But however, we should uh, appreciate that all the faith group come together, uh, this COP, which is for the first time in history, uh, 300 uh, conversation and others, uh, 1.5 pro project, uh, million uh, project tackling by the faith group. It's, it's make uh, a commitment actually. Um, and we are here, not just starting, but we are doing something. Uh, however, uh, we have, we grace uh, that uh, 
this conversation, this uh, COP will come later and next year and on the other COP will coming. The commitment itself should be implemented. What Dr. Chip uh, Zakaria said uh, regarding the, the commitment of the funding is whether it's significant or not. What we have our own uh, resource actually. What is our own resource in faith group? Actually, we have institution. We have uh, a kind of uh, philanthropical resources and we have morally. This moral is very important. Um, we are guardians of the creation. 85% we believe that they are a creators of this planet and they, they send a message for us that human beings should guard. We are the last generation, they said. And, and we, we have a commitment. So, so 85% of the world is religious. 80, um, let's, let's say that 85% of those politicians um, um, at the event um, you know, are, are, are religious. And of course, those that aren't also have um, uh, human values very much at their, their heart. I'm just wondering why it's proved so difficult to reach the, the agreement that they need to, to really help the most vulnerable communities that are being affected by climate change, to challenge the powerful uh, and, and the rich nations and tell them to step up more. I mean, what, what gets in the way between the human heart and the political systems, which means that it's just such a struggle? Well, you know, uh, human is human. Uh, they uh, have the greediness and we, we have problem with this. As we have uh, dialogue, something that uh, we have to be uh, put in, in the table, the conversation. Uh, even UN, United Nations can kind of tackling of this uh, situation, you know. Um, however, we as human, we have commitment. Uh, whoever you are, um, faith group bring moral issues in, in this. Uh, so speak loudly speak loudly from the faith pavilion. Um, even um, I also meet uh, my uh, college of my friends, uh, still don't understand why religion should take uh, in pop for, for the climate change. I said, mm -hmm. religions is bringing moral, um, uh, you know, bringing a sign to the heart of and the mind of the people. Mm -hmm. So Thank you. Mind of, mind of people, and we are the largest uh, group uh, after science, you know, who can mobilize our uh, followers. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Jennifer Larby from Christian Aid has also um, joined us. Jennifer, I don't know how much of the discussion you've been able to hear, but I just wonder um, from the position of an aid organization, um, Working in so many affected areas, I just I just wonder what your what your feelings are as the, the sort of the COP struggles to some sort of conclusion. Apologies, I'm just in transit from um, from COP um, and haven't been able to carry the most quietly space to join this um, call. Uh, but good to be with you. Um, I suppose really briefly where um, where I'm sitting from um, at Christian Aid, an organisation that um, represents. Um, communities and countries who are really on the front line of a climate crisis they didn't uh, cause. The COP, it's been, it's, it's been a series of ways, if you like, because we started off with the, um, the really great um, welcome success of the loss and damage funds being established and being operationalized and us seeing money flowing in uh, to that um, fund. So yeah. we certainly started off with really high hopes that the establishment of the funds and the, um, the um, funds going into the funds would really set a good course forward for um, the COP to come. Um, but steadily we found lots to be disappointed um, about as the negotiations. Yeah. So Jennifer, I'm... Hard. I'm really sorry. It's really um, very difficult to um, hear what you have to say. I, mean, I, I got that, that the loss and damage fund is something to be welcomed, but that it's getting rather more disappointing as, as you progress. I'm really sorry. Um, 
that I, I can't stay with you to hear Sorry. more, but it's just a bit, little bit difficult on the audio. I just want to ask a question. I don't know if people um, want to raise their hands to um, res respond to this, but I mean, if um, if there's no agreement on fossil fuels, I think people are saying the COP isn't a complete failure. Um, but I think that's what people in this room are saying. I think others might say something else. Um, but if, if the COP collapses, does that kind of send the message that needs to be heard? That, you know, um, that, you know, that if there's some sort of muddle through or some sort of agreement that nobody's really happy with, that that sort of allows allows people to think, oh, well, something yeah, something was achieved. Whereas, in fact, you know, if the most urgent need isn't being addressed, perhaps we just need to that wake up call. I mean, I don't know if there's anyone who wants to speak to that. I just throw it out there. It's a very difficult one to, to answer because you don't want to to say, I mean, I mean, where I'm sitting right now, I feel that a bad outcome is worse than no outcome. That's what it feels like to me right now, an outcome that does not address the issues of fossil fuels. Um, as the, 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 it's, it, it, I, I, I just can't bear the thought of going to another COP, frankly, where we, or the, another COP having an outcome that does not recognise or does not agree to, to phase out fossil fuels. Vanessa Nakati has just published an article in The Guardian where she says it feels like the lifeboat of humanity is sinking right now. Thank you. Let's just turn here what Farah has to say about that and then Carlos and then um, perhaps Chief Dolawari Zakari would like to come in as, as one of the more um, hopeful voices on this call, I think. Farah. Thank you, Rosie. So if, uh, I mean... It's terrible to even imagine that we don't walk away with some with what we would have wanted in hand. And um, this is my first COP. So I think people who are more seasoned, like Dr. Gold, are indeed very weary and, and tired of, you know, broken promises and, and false hopes. Um, and but I do, but I do echo what she says that we do need to carry on. But the way I would carry on is that I think there needs to be a very long, hard look at the sort of accessibility issues and privilege that is governing the COP space. Um, you know, and and I'm gonna tie in some bits from this conversation really quick, but I mean, you asked, you know, what the gap between the politics and the heart. Well, I mean, who are we counting on to lead us out of this? We're we're relying upon the you know, that you started the problem, now you find the solution. That's the method we're constantly relying upon. The COP space and the agreement and the power, where the power is in the room, um, is very much in the same space and represented by the same sort of patriarchal corporate power that put us into this uh, situation in the first place. And the other thing is that I think with, with um, countries that, you know, are not as wealthy or not don't have as much of a say they are just kind of on the receiving end they're constantly reiterating I think the Mar it was the Marshall Islands that said we do not want to go silently to our watery graves and they're just having to you know make a display of the danger that they're in make a show of the um, danger that they face and the threat to their their heritage their lives their existence and that is that just tells you that who is asking who for what and that tells you everything about where the power is in the room um and so we do need to to look into that and address that yeah uh, going I, forward thank you very much indeed Vera. can i come to you carlos and then um to chief dolawara zakaria i would just say that we need to go beyond cops it's mm. really quite frankly the the uh we're just going as humanity we're just banging on the same wall every time um and we're not we're not achieving the results that we need and when I say this is that uh, you can see that the COPs are structured around the policy science nexus. OK, so a lot of the uh, a lot of the, the, the statements are around the scientific uh, net zero discourse. 
And what we're saying is that we need to go to the root causes of this. But think of an alternative. Think, for instance, what will it mean to be doing in 2025, for instance, in Belen, in Brazil, uh, the heart of the, you know, part of the, part of the Amazon, something like this COP. It would be just, it would just be mind boggling. You wouldn't do such things. 75,000 around um, uh, the, uh, contaminating and, and, and doing just, frank, quite frankly, not uh, achieving the same structural radical thing that we need to do. What we need to do, I would say, is we need to um, have more local uh, structured participation where all the communities are really going through in, in what it is an emergency beyond the COPs. And a lot of the money that's been invested in COPs needs to be flowing into the root uh, communities that couldn't be in this space. And, and also in processes of dialogue that are really more meaningful um, for the communities that include the faith communities, but also include women, youth, indigenous, not all the indigenous communities are, 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 are uh, where it, at COP, where the ones that we need to, um, you know, they're not representing the whole of humanity. Okay. I think that uh, what is significant is that uh, even bringing the faith pavilion is an achievement. That's significant. And then also recognizing that we should not be swayed with the few countries who are making things difficult for us not to get to that level. I'm very hopeful that, uh, like my colleague said, we should go beyond just this scope. We should move as faith leaders, we are accessible in every community, we are accessible in every hamlet, and it, we already have the structures to be able to do the advocacy, to be able to do the training and capacity building of our people. And I think that if we do this, it's going to go a long ways to be the game changer of bringing everybody on board to understand that we have no option but to pick this particular team. But sincerely, I hope that there will be something at the end. Thank you. I just want to read out what Jennifer's written in the uh, chat box because she wasn't able to stay on the call because of the audio. She says, I wanted to say that starting the COP with funds committed to the loss and damage fund was a real high. However, there's been a steady decline in ambition and commitment, particularly around the global stock take and the phase out of fossil fuels. The faith leadership and narrative has helped bring moral clarity to this COP about why we are still here. I think there's a broad agreement on that this COP more than any previous one. For us at Christian Aid, we recognise that COP is not the only game in town and we will seek to engage with other global processes to engage with an influenced climate policy. Um, Alan... Otaro, um, Catholic Youth Network. Um, what uh, what are your take take home thoughts? Yeah, thank you. And um, I, I think um, we went from uh, Copenhagen to Paris. So um, the capacity for uh, humans to rise up to the challenge um, is there, um, even though of course uh, there might be delays um, that occasion. Um, and, and we do not have the time for these delays in terms of what the science uh, is telling us. But for me, I go back to what Pope Francis says in both Laudato Si and Laudato Deum about um, the structure of the international governance mechanisms that we have, their weakness, but also um, the ability of humans to uh, make those structures work for uh, for the good of all. So um, given the experience of, of you know, the disappointment at Copenhagen and how that then over a number of years transformed into the Paris Agreement, uh, eventually, I think, you know, say something about, um, you know, the sign of hope. But the point that has also been made about engaging with other structures, I think that is very important because next year will also be the summit of the future, which will be looking at reforming the international financial architecture, for example, and some of the problems we are having with, for example, the loss and damage fund, the depression fund, and all these mechanisms stems from the fact that the, the, the international financial architecture to start with is broken. Um, and so we are caught up in, you know, in, in the middle of all this, um, you know, back and forth, um, you know, because of that. But also the reform of the United Nations system itself. Um, you know, if you look at the Security Council and how that cascades you know, all the way down to other uh, intergovernmental processes, you can see that there is there is a challenge there. So it's important also that we keep tabs and you know we keep our finger on the pulse of what else is happening uh, around, so that you know we are able to change something also with Thank this uh, with this process. I'm going to just read. Um... A comment um, from the COP from a Samoan climate activist um, and ask 
um, him or somebody else um, to respond to that. Um, Lorna, maybe you could also respond to this. Um, how, the question is, how do we go home and face our children? How do we go home and face our people in the Pacific Islands and tell them that our governments have sold them out? I can't answer that. Can you? Well, I've had to come home to my own children and have that kind of conversation. I think we have to continue um, stubbornly to, to kind of reinforce that this is not how the, the story ends. This is not how it ends. This is, as uh, Alan said, this is a really serious setback in the journey. But as people of faith, as people who care about the future, we're going to redouble our efforts. And I think what's come to the fore at this COP is the strength of the faith community, the unity of the faith community in addressing this challenge. That hasn't diminished. So whereas I might sound like a, pessim a jaded pessimist, I'm absolutely not. I'm absolutely convinced that hope comes when we take action. But I think that there's a real moment now of focusing squarely on the root causes, both the root causes in terms of the spiritual and the behavioural root causes, but also the change, the specific change we need to make to our energy system. That has really, that's the genie that's out the bottle now. Yeah. There's nowhere to hide yeah. on that. And that's where faith communities can really play a major part. In thank you. That. Um, thank you um, so much, everybody. Um, I'm, there's a news tweet somewhere that says that um, journalists and negotiators and everyone else is ex are expecting to get no sleep tonight as COP continues into um, another day. Um, so um, along with you, I'll be watching um, to see what happens. But for now, thank you so much, everybody. It's been um, really kind of you to take time out and to share with us what you're thinking in a also surprisingly sort of... Um, well, the moments of hope in there um, are, are, are good to hear. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, well, see you at the next COP maybe.